trust that everybody's okay. I can see a good picture of the Elliots. So, John, would you do the honors and put your thumbs up if you can hear me well? Is this a good volume? Okay, good. It's good to see all my friends from Greenwood Hills, from Lansdowne, from Gilbertsville, from other places perhaps. We welcome you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wish I could be with you all physically, but our family's here broadcasting live from the Bruce Allen Kaiser Memorial Library. So uh, we're glad to be sharing the Word of God with you. And to start this morning, we want to look into the book of Psalms, Psalm 118, verse 1, Psalm 118, verse 1, just to give us a theme verse, Psalm 118, verse 1, very famous words, it says, O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Now that last phrase, for his mercy endures forever, frequently appears in the Word of God. Uh, for example, in Psalm 136, every verse in Psalm 136 ends with that phrase. And so the whole psalm from beginning to end wants to remind us that the mercy of the Lord endures forever. There's a verse in Proverbs 18.24 that says, He who has friends must show himself friendly, but there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And I want to think this morning with you about the loyalty of the Lord Jesus Christ. The loyalty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when we think about friendship, one of the common and core ideas of friendship is the word loyalty. That friends are loyal to us. That we speak about friends through thick and thin. And this word mercy that we've read here in Psalm 118 verse 1 is a very rich Hebrew word that the English translators struggle to render. Sometimes they translate it mercy. Sometimes they translate it love. Some translations say steadfast love. The older translations have a very good word, I think. They call it loving kindness. And we sing that hymn, don't we? His loving kindness, oh how great. So I want to think with you this morning about this God who has a steadfast love, which is loving kindness, and it is covenant love. It is based on the promises of God, and we're going to follow through in the life of the Lord Jesus some things that show his loyalty, and I think we won't have to imagine too hard to think about the application to our situation today, that the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been loyal in history, remains loyal to us today. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 7, for example, verse 25, that he ever lives to make intercession for us. So think of that, that our loyal Lord Jesus Christ, in our way of thinking, 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, has us on his mind and on his heart, and he is praying for us. He is, as he said to Peter in Luke 22, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And so what security that believers have in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I don't want to presume anything. There might be somebody listening now or somebody that will watch this on recording who doesn't know the Lord Jesus. And I want to tell you, he's the best friend you could ever have. He's already demonstrated what sort of a friend he is by taking up our greatest need, our indebtedness, we had a great debt of sin as human beings, every one of us. I may be wearing a nice shirt and tie this morning, but don't let the appearance fool you. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am someone who deserved the wrath of God. I deserved God's judgment on my sin because I was one of those sheep who had gone astray and turned to my own way. But instead of putting the wrath on me, instead of judging me for my sin, the Lord Jesus came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lord Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And if you're looking for a friend today, not only because he will stay close to you and promises never to leave you nor forsake you, not only because he will strengthen you and encourage you, but because you can say, this is the one who has reconciled me to God. This is the one who has made peace between a holy God and me. And I know my peace is made. He is my peace, who's made the two one. He's brought together Jew and Gentile in one body, Ephesians 2 says. 
Every person in the world can know this peace with God because having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, justifies us. And Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what a wonderful thing it is. The hymn writer said, Peace with God, the blood in heaven speaks of pardon now for me. Peace with God, the Lord is risen. Righteousness now counts me free. Don't you want to be free? Don't you want to enjoy spiritual freedom? To know that you don't have to worry about judgment. You don't have to worry about leaving this world and going to hell and being separated from God for eternity. You can be brought to know God here and now. The Lord Jesus spoke of eternal life in relational terms. He says, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John seventeen three. I pray that you'll come to know him today, that you'll say, my Lord and my God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That you'll cry out of your sin and your bondage, and you'll say that Christ is the Savior of sinners, the only one who can save you. You'll say, Christ is the Savior of sinners. Christ is the Savior for me. Well, many of us have done that, and we can say this morning, the mercy of the Lord, his loving kindness endures forever. Now, I want to think about the Lord's loyalty in five different categories, or we should say his loyalty toward five different groups. We're going to think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty toward his family. We're going to think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty toward Israel. We're going to think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty toward the government. We're going to think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty toward his friends. And finally, we're going to think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty to his Father, the God of heaven. And we know the Lord Jesus is God as well. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is a triune Godhead, a trinity, as the term is. A word we don't find in our Bible, but a word that describes what we do find in our Bible all over the place, Old and New Testament, that Jesus is both God and man, and that he's been raised and declared so to the universe, God hath raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 says. Now, for our first New Testament scripture, let's turn to Luke 2, as we think about the Lord Jesus' loyalty toward his family. The Lord Jesus' loyalty toward his family. Now, it's wonderful to think about the fact that the Lord Jesus... As God the Son has always existed, the Son of God never had a moment when he came into being. In fact, John 1 verse 3 is pretty explicit that all things had their being through him. That's how Mr. Darby renders it. And without him was not anything receiving its being that has its being. So everything that exists exists because of the Lord Jesus. Revelation 4 tells us that all things are and were created, or all things exist and were created because of him. And Colossians 1 tells us that all things were made through him and for him, and by him all things consist, or the thought is they hold together, they cohere. So the Lord Jesus is the creator, but himself uncreated. And yet there was a moment in time when this eternal God, the one who was spoken of in John 1.1 1, 1, as the Word, that he stepped into time. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or pitched his tent, tabernacled, if you will, among us. And when we come to Luke chapter 2, we look in at verse 51, that now, at this stage, the Lord Jesus by now is 12 years old, and it comes right after the incident where they went up to the feast at Jerusalem, and the Lord Jesus was there in the temple giving these wondrous answers and uh, asking tremendous questions of the theologians and the experts in the scripture there. And Mary and Joseph are very worried about him. So the Lord Jesus asked the question in verse 49, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Now, we're going to talk later about the Lord's loyalty to his father. And even here, we can think about him as a 12-year-old boy, that the Lord Jesus was thinking in terms of his chief loyalty, that he was loyal above all to the father. But look at what it says in verse 51. Then he went down with them 
and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, when we talk about loyalty to his family, we see even here from childhood that the Lord Jesus was an obedient son. Many a time in my youth, my parents had to quote to me Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. They had to quote that over and over again because my natural tendency was to not obey my parents. But when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, it's quite different that he ever and always adhered to the fifth commandment of the Decalogue. What we call the Ten Commandments, number five says, honor thy father and mother. And the Lord Jesus always did that perfectly. Now, when you think that this is the eternal son of God, that this is the one who made the world and everything in it and everything belongs to him. When you think of the fact that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, that in his deity he is omnipresent in the universe, present everywhere at once, when you think of his superlative holiness, his perfect righteousness, his magnificent and unparalleled love, you would say such a great one as that would submit to Mary and Joseph? And yet that's exactly what the Bible tells us. You talk about loyalty. The Lord Jesus was always loyal to his family, always loyal to his parents, and we'll see also loyal to his siblings as well. Now, we have to be careful about this because loyalty, as we said, has degrees. His chief loyalty was to the Father. And the Lord Jesus, in being loyal to the Father, was able also to be loyal to Mary and Joseph. In other words, to be loyal to your family, to honor your father and mother, to show them the proper respect that is due, and to take care of your loved ones, ordinarily, that is consonant with our loyalty to God the Father. There's nothing, in other words, that goes against God to be loyal to your family, to love your parents, to love your brothers and sisters, that is indeed something that God commands and something that pleases and brings honor and glory to God. But the Lord Jesus in his teaching and even in his example showed that loyalty to God must come even before loyalty to family. You remember in John chapter 2, there was the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee and how the Lord Jesus was invited to that wedding feast and he went and his mother came to him, Mary came and said, they have no wine. And so the Lord Jesus said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And we might think, well, that doesn't sound like he's showing so much loyalty to Mary. She's come and obviously she's suggesting to the Lord that he ought to do something about the situation. And yet the Lord was not running on Mary's timetable. And he was not taking his orders from Mary. And may I say reverently that the risen Christ in heaven at the right hand of the Father still doesn't take his orders from Mary. So there's no point in anybody praying to Mary. That's not only unbiblical and counter-biblical, but it demeans the authority of our Lord. Our Lord had a higher loyalty. Our Lord was going on the Father's timetable. And so he would speak to her respectfully. In English, it sounds a little abrasive. Woman, what have I to do with thee? And yet, those who are knowledgeable of the Greek at a very high level tell us that there's nothing rude about our Lord's speech or about how he spoke to her, keep, keeping in mind the culture and the time and place. You remember later, his brothers came to him in John chapter 7, and there was a feast of the Jews. And they said, why don't you go up to Jerusalem? And, you know, no one who wants to be known hides himself away in secret. And their inference seems to be that go up, do some miracles, press the flesh a little bit. You know, we're living in campaign season, aren't we? So we can't turn on the news without hearing about the candidates and those who are president or who aspire to be president. And they're going around uh, as much as social distancing allows, making speeches. And in good times, they kiss babies and hug people and shake hands and all that kind of thing. And the brothers were saying, you know, Jesus, if you want notoriety, if you want to get known, if you want to be famous, you need to go up to Jerusalem and do some miracles and do your teaching and show yourself to the people. 
And yet when you read a gospel like the gospel according to Mark, it's amazing how much the Lord shunned notoriety, how much he was not interested in publicity, how much he would heal someone like the leper in Mark chapter 1 and say, don't tell anyone about this. Or when he healed Jairus' daughter by raising her from the dead, he told them not to speak to anyone about that. That that time and place was not the time to declare every wonder that the Lord was was doing in his compassion because the multitudes already were thronging him and the Lord was without in desert places, the Bible says. So it actually became an impediment to the spread of the word. Now the Lord said to his brethren in John 7, you go up because your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you. See, his brethren didn't yet believe in him, John explains. He said, my time is not yet. He would go up, but he would go up in secret. He would go up at his Father in heaven's behest. Now, in saying that to his brethren, he was not disloyal to them ultimately. Because the best thing we can do for our families is show loyalty to God. By being loyal to God the Father, I will be a better son. By being loyal to God the Father, you can be a better daughter if you're a woman. And you can be a better brother, a better sister. You can be a better husband, a better wife. Whatever your situation is, if you put God in his proper place, if you esteem him above everything else, if you love the Lord Jesus as your head and say, I'm going to submit to you, Lord. The Lord doesn't hinder your work in the home. The Lord doesn't hinder you as an employee at your job or as a student at your school. The Lord will actually make you better in all of those categories because if you're giving God his proper place, then that has the trickle-down goodness effect. You've heard of trickle-down economics? Well, this is trickle-down righteousness. That as we give God his place... That can't help but spill over into our families and among our friends. Now look with me at John 19 a moment. Because I think this really underscores our Lord's loyalty to his family. John 19. And by this point, when we come to John 19.25, our Lord is on the cross. And you can imagine, as a man, what the Lord is going through. The physical pain, the nails through his hands and feet, the sore back from the flogging that he took, the sore face from the buffeting, the hair from his beard plucked out, the crown of thorns beaten into his head with the rod, the difficulty of being nailed to that Roman cross and hanging up there, physiologically speaking, with difficulty to breathe. And all of that tremendous suffering. And yet verse 25, John 19, 25 says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Later, I believe it's the last appearance of Mary. We find her in Acts chapter 1 in the upper room with the other disciples. She's there with John and the others and other believers as well. About 120 of them gathered. And even while he was dying on the cross, our Lord was taking care of his filial duty. He was the good son who was going to make sure that his mother was provided for. Now, if it was merely a matter of material and economic provision, maybe the Lord could say to himself, well, I have other half-brothers, of course. I have sisters. Their families will surely take care of mom. But he wanted to commit her to someone who was a disciple, someone who believed in him, someone who would faithfully take care of his mother. And sometimes there's been situations where missionaries out on the field or believers for one reason or another aren't physically in the position where they can take care of their parents. But yet other saints step in and they take on that role. That's a tremendous ministry. There are a lot of older people that need help, that need material help, that need 
physical help that need people to stop by and check on them, people to pray for them, people to write to them, people to call to them. What a wonderful privilege we have as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ to do that for the family of God. And we think about how the church was not only concerned about the poor in their early days, but they were also concerned about the widows. That was one of the first big disputes in Acts 6 was about the care of the widows. And yet our Lord, when he was dying on the cross, he shows us where his heart is. He's saying, behold your mother and woman, behold your son. He's creating that safety net of family for Mary, that even when the Lord has departed from the scene, she'll be provided for emotionally as well as physically. Now, it's tremendous when you think of how the Lord rebuked the Jews in Mark chapter 7, for example, over the way their traditions had come in and set aside the command of God. And they had that whole thing of korban, where they would say, well, I'd love to take care of you, mom and dad, but the money that I was going to use to take care of you, I gave it to the temple. It's devoted to God. So I can't touch it. I mean, it's the Lord's money. And yet they could use the rest of their money on themselves sort of uh, freely. And this was a corrupt deal between the religious leadership of that day and many of the Jewish people. And the Lord condemned that. He said, by your tradition, you set aside the commandment of God and you don't permit someone to do any more for his parents. They were actually setting aside the command to honor the father and mother. And the Lord condemned that in the strongest terms because the Lord was loyal to his family, loyal to Joseph and Mary. You can think of how he worked with Joseph in the carpenter shop. How do I know that? Because Matthew says, is this not the son of the carpenter when he came to Nazareth? And Mark says that they said in Mark 6, is this not the carpenter? So he worked with his father and probably eventually inherited that business in Nazareth. He was faithful to Joseph and Mary and always honored them, always was loyal. But secondly, the Lord Jesus, oh, by the way, one more citation we might give. 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it's verse 7. Among the post-resurrection appearances of our Lord, he appeared unto James. And that is James, who's the Lord's half-brother. So although the disciples didn't believe, uh, sorry, although the brethren, his brothers, didn't seem to believe on him before the cross and after the resurrection, he actually visited one like James and showed him who he was. And James became a faithful believer. It is likely he who was used of the Spirit of God to write the epistle of James. So the Lord's loyalty to his family. Now secondly, the Lord's loyalty to Israel. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point, but go back to Luke, tw- uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke 4. The Lord's loyalty to Israel. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Luke four sixteen. Sorry, my window's open, so my pages are blowing around. Let me get there again. I had it and lost it. No. Luke four sixteen. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all of them in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now the Lord was quoting from Isaiah 42, what we call the first servant song. The others are in Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50. The last three verses of Isaiah 52 
along with chapter 53 of Isaiah. Four servant songs about the suffering servant in Isaiah. And this one speaks about the Lord's faithfulness to Israel coming to exercise this compassionate ministry of preaching the word of God to them. We can think of how John says in John chapter 1 that he came unto his own things, but his own people received him not. And yet, as our Lord went about doing good and exercising his ministry, Israel was always paramount in his thoughts. That the ministry actually began with him being marked out before the nation in that baptism of John the Baptist. That unlike everyone else who came to John for baptism, our Lord was not a sinner. Our Lord had no sin. Our Lord did nothing wrong. He never had an errant or an unclean thought. Our Lord was pure within and without. He was absolutely spotless and we might say impeccable as God manifest in the flesh, incapable of sinning. And yet, at that, resu- at that uh, baptism, excuse me, he would identify himself with the nation. He would say, this people who's, who need righteousness, who need a righteousness applied to their account, I'm going to take their place. We'd say today that he swaps places. He exchanges places with us. He takes the place of the sinner on the cross of Calvary. And he gives to us his place. He gives to us righteousness of God, Romans 3 says. That's what it means to be justified, to be declared righteous in God's sight. And our Lord Jesus, from that baptism, went on and he went through Israel. And when he would encounter Gentiles, he would be merciful to them, but he would always make them know, like he made known to the Syrophoenician woman, I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his primary mission. Not that he didn't want to save Gentiles as well, but it was to fulfill the promises made to Israel, all the prophecies made to them, because through Israel, God was going to bless the whole world. And that plan is still in force. The Lord was loyal to Israel. When you think of how he was in Galatians 4.4, 4, in the fullness of time, he came forth born of a woman, born under the law. Can you imagine the Son of God being circumcised to keep the law? The Son of God being presented in the temple before the Lord with the redemption coinage. The Son of God growing up an observant Jew, following the law of God. And as he said, I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill. And the Lord Jesus, throughout all of his ministry, presenting himself over and over and over again to Israel. And yet at the end of his ministry, what could we say? Well, look at Matthew 23 with me. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, the end of the chapter, verse 37. And our Lord is standing outside Jerusalem for the last time prior to going to the cross. Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now, in the Bible, when you see a name repeated like that, it expresses deep emotion. It is what the scholars call a Semiticism. In other words, people who thought in Hebrew or in Aramaic or even Arabic and other kindred languages, they would repeat a person's name or a place's name out of deep love, deep affection, deep feeling. You can think about David saying, Absalom, Absalom, my son, would to God I had died for thee. Here in verse 37, the Lord Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. Till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus here actually is quoting Psalm 118, that psalm that we began our message with this morning. And he's saying to Jerusalem, how I wanted to take you under my wings like that mother hen. How I wanted to offer you that safety and security. Psalm 91 speaks about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and being under the shadow of his wings. Think about the great protection to the one who comes to the Lord for his shielding. 
Proverbs says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. And our Lord here wants to gather Jerusalem, wants to protect Jerusalem. And yet the thing that hinders is not a lack of loyalty on the Lord's part, not a lack of love and faithfulness and loving kindness. But what is the limiting factor is that he says you would not, you didn't want it. And what was true of Israel could be said of the whole world today, Jew and Gentile, that the Lord Jesus offers himself to the world. And how many people say, no, I don't want that. Maybe they want the blessings that come from salvation. They want to live forever. They want eternal life. They want a glorified body. They want to be free of the fear of COVID-19. They want to be free of economic troubles and problems. They want to be free of political oppression, as many people in different parts of the world endure. Uh, The Jews of the Lord's day were just like that. They wanted all those benefits. They wanted the kingdom. The problem is they didn't want the king. And the Lord said to them here that their house was left to them desolate. Why? Because he says, you'll see me no more. (laughs) You see, you can't have the blessings of the kingdom. You can't have the blessings of the church, for that matter, in this age. Nor can you have the blessings of heaven without the Lord Jesus. He is the one who makes eternal life worth having. He is the one that makes heaven heaven. I'm not interested, as glorious as it's going to be, to see the throne surrounded by the rainbow and to see the sapphire pavement stone underneath that throne and to see the streets made of gold and the names on the gates of pearl in the new Jerusalem as wondrous as the sardius and amethyst amethyst and jacinth and all the other precious stones that the Bible talks about. So much more wondrous it will be to see the Lord Jesus. The hymn writer has said, Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Right up to the end, the Lord was loyal to Israel, presenting himself to the very last moment. And yet they would reject him and send him to the cross, and the Gentiles would have their part in putting him there too. And ultimately, we can all take the blame, can't we? We say with the modern hymn writer, Stuart Townend, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. It was for me he died. It was for my sins. Dying for me, dying for me. There on the cross, he was dying for me. Now the Lord was loyal to Israel right to the end. And when the Lord rose again, Guess who he sent the apostles to preach to in the book of Acts first? He said, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. Wait, Lord, Jerusalem is the city that cast you out, that took you outside like you were unclean and nailed you to a cross. And yet that's the first place you want to hear the good news. You want them to be the first to hear the glad tidings, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, you'll be witnesses to me there. And then Judea that territory around Jerusalem, and then Samaria, those people that also rejected the Lord many times. He came to one of their villages, and they didn't want to receive him. And the disciples said, Lord, shall we call down fire? He said, no, you don't know what spirit you're of. And then finally, to the uttermost parts of the earth, even to Rome, as we see in the last chapter of Acts, Acts 28. He's in Rome, witnessing to Israel, witnessing to a Jewish delegation right to the end. So think of our Lord's loyalty to Israel, that he was loyal to them to the end and is still loyal, by the way. Romans 9, 10, and 11 say that he still has that future for Israel nationally and that even now he's saving a remnant that many Jews are coming to know the Lord Jesus and they may not be the majority in the church right now, but the day's coming when Israel will be restored to the Lord and they will be saved as Zechariah 12 predicted. Now, thirdly, the Lord Jesus is not only loyal to his family and to Israel, but we could say the Lord Jesus is loyal to the government. And since we're in Matthew, just turn back to Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. And the Lord Jesus was asked a series of questions by his adversaries in this chapter. Matthew 22, verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. 
And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true, and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone. In other words, they weren't, he wasn't one to show partiality. For you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Now the Lord Jesus was always loyal to the government, wherever he possibly could be. In other words, the word of God's very realistic about government, and it tells us that sometimes government acts unrighteously. Of course, the Lord couldn't go along with anything that the government did that was unrighteous. The Lord would continue to observe that loyalty to his father above any government. We, we think about the book of Daniel, how it gives us those instances of how God's people had to submit to the government except when the government commanded something against the word of God. And so we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who would not bow to the idol. And for that loyalty to the Lord, they were cast into the burning fiery furnace. We know the Lord was loyal to them because he was in the furnace with them and preserved them through the fire, just like he's preserving many of us through this current time of trial. And one way or another, he is going to preserve us. If he takes some of us home to glory, we'll not be the loser for that. We're going to go and be with our Lord, which is far better, Paul said in Philippians 1. But may God help us to be a good testimony and to be submissive to the government the way the Word of God teaches us to be. That First Timothy 2 tells us to pray for our leaders, not only for their government, but also for their souls, that they'd get saved. And also, of course, First Peter 2 tells us to honor the king, that Peter believed in submitting to the government. Peter was talking about Nero, the Caesar who, even to this day, was known for his wickedness and the dissolute nature of his life. And yet Peter says that we're to submit to him. And of course, the Spirit of God used Paul in Romans 13 to tell us that we ought to subject ourselves to the powers that be. Now, when the Lord was asked about the tax money, you have to understand that the tax system in their day was grossly unfair. And uh, the, any kind of tax system in modern Western countries that we have is a lot more moral and better than the system they had back in those days because there was so much corruption in it and the people were ground down. And yet the Lord said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So give God that supreme loyalty, but then give Caesar what you need to give to Caesar, what your requirement is. And we remember in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord told them, if one bids you to go a mile, which was a Roman law, they could compel a non-Roman citizen to carry a burden for a mile for the Roman army or something. And he said, go with them twain, go with them twice as far. This is the spirit of one who has that kind of love of the Lord Jesus, that loyalty to the government. It's ironic then that the government that prided itself on law and order, the Romans would pride themselves on their laws. They would talk about the Lex Romana, the Roman law, making the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And they looked at themselves as bringing peace and civilization to the barbarians, to all these hinterlands that needed laws and rules. And this nation that even bequeathed to us so many of our laws and rules, that's why we have a writ of habeas corpus. Why do lawyers talk in Latin so much? Well, because we got a lot of our law system from the Romans and from the Greeks and from the Hebrews as well. All Judeo-Christian in its underlying principles. And yet, that government that loved law so much, that talked about law and order, actually had the most unjust trial in the history of the world. It was the trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you remember, totally against the law, totally against everything that was right, the Lord Jesus, who was the only 
perfect man who's ever walked on the face of the earth, the only sinless one, God manifest in the flesh. The Lord Jesus was condemned to death unjustly. And do you remember one of the charges they brought against him? When the Sanhedrin brought him before Pilate, they couldn't say, well, this man's a blasphemer. I mean, that was not admissible in a Roman court. So they said, this man is stirring up the people against the government. He's traitorous. He's a seditious person. And later they'd make similar accusations against the Christians in the book of Acts, especially when Paul was on trial. But of course, it's not true. The Lord was not saying to overthrow the Roman government, nor was he trying to overthrow the Roman government. And the Lord was telling people to submit to the government and pay their taxes, but only honor God above all. And yet they would condemn him as someone who was an enemy of Caesar. I tell you, Caesar never had a greater friend if he would have received him. So our Lord was loyal to his family, loyal to Israel, loyal to the government, and we can say loyal to his friends. Now time is going on. I will just go to one passage with you, John 15. John 15. John 15 and verse 11. And in John 15, it's part of the upper room ministry of Christ, or what our dear brother Tyrannus Wilson used to call the farewell ministry of Christ. And he's preparing his disciples for the time when he'll go away. He says in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. He's going to go on and say in his great prayer in John 17 to his father, Father, of those that thou hast given me, I have lost none, except for the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And you can think of how the Lord Jesus acted toward them as the protector, that he never let anything happen to his disciples. While they were with him, no harm came to them. If they were hungry, he arranged food for them. And not only miraculously in the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, but one thinks about that Passover meal that he prepared. And how he would sit on that last Passover night with the disciples and he would institute something new. He would bring forth bread and a cup and he would say, this bread is my body given for you. And he would say, this cup is given as the new covenant of my blood. Now we think about that new covenant, what this Lord's Supper that the Lord instituted really is, is a covenant meal. We can see that idea in the Old Testament with uh, different situations, like in Isaac's case in Genesis 26, where he sits down and makes a meal and makes a covenant or a treaty with the Philistines. We see it again in Jacob's life in Genesis 31. And we see it with Israel in Exodus 24, actually eating a meal as they gaze at the glory of God on Mount Sinai. And the New Testament equivalent is as the Lord sits down with his people and gives them the bread and the cup to memorialize what he's done, to remember that he's giving his life, that all of his loyalty flows out of this great sacrifice that he's going to give to take care of our sins. And what's more, not only that, that this cup is the new covenant of his blood. Now the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 as Hebrew says, made with Judah and Israel and going to be fulfilled in a fuller, greater way in a future day when Israel's restored. But even now, the provisos of that new covenant get extended to us. Paul called the apostles in Second Corinthians ministers of the new covenant. And you remember what the new covenant said. God said, I will be your God and you'll be my people. He said, you won't have to teach anyone to know me because all will know me. So to be a believer, to be in the new covenant, you've got to know the Lord. And then he said, your sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. We say with Spafford, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought is nailed to his cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. 
But then this ongoing aspect, he said, he will write on your minds and on your hearts my law. And that's what the Lord's doing by his spirit today. Our sanctification, as we come to submit more and more to the Lord, and he begins to change our hearts and minds, that we think like the Lord, that our minds are not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2, but they're transformed by the renewing of our minds, that they become more like the Lord Jesus' mind. We have this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. We think of others. And our loyalty is to, toward God, and our loyalty is toward others, just like our great friend, the Lord Jesus. The friend that sticks closer than a brother. The friend that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The one who says in Matthew 28, I am with, thee, uh, I am with you unto the end of the age. Now, lastly, the Lord is loyal to his Father. And really, we could have spent the whole message talking about this. Because from the moment he stepped out of heaven's glory, he was on his Father's business, wasn't he? He said in Luke 2.49, Did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? And when the Lord began his ministry, he was there attested by his Father at the baptism of John. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And from there, the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. For what point? To be tempted of the devil. And each temptation, what did the Lord do? Each temptation, he showed his loyalty to his father. I will not turn the stones into bread because my father has not told me to do that. I will not throw myself down from the pinnacle of the temple because that wouldn't be to honor and glorify my God. That would be to tempt him. And I will not bow down before you, Satan, because thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. As he went about his ministry, every word that he spoke, he could say, the words that I speak are the Father's words. Every act that he did, he could say, the works that I do are my Father's works. And he could come to the Father in John 17 and say, Father, I have done the work which thou hast given me to do. The fact that he was about to go to the cross and finish it was not in doubt whatsoever. And the Lord Jesus never more so than at Calvary. Philippians 2 says he was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Oh, the loyalty he had to his Father. That right to the end, he said, the cup that my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And the Lord would there drink it. All of those loyalties came together at the cross. The loyalty to his family, the loyalty to Israel, the loyalty to the government, the loyalty to his friends, the loyalty to us, we could say, whom he makes friends by faith in him, and ultimately the loyalty to his Father, because the Lord Jesus finished that work. He said, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he went back to heaven's glory, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says all enemies are going to be put under his feet. But 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that when that happens, what does he do? He shows loyalty to his Father. He gives the kingdom to the Father and says, There, Father, it's yours, that all may honor the Father. Now, isn't that wonderful to think of? This is our loyal, faithful friend. Has he forgotten us in these times of social distancing? Is there any distance between God and us? Is there any trial we can go through? Romans 8 says, no, neither height nor depth nor any other creature. Not sword or famine or peril or distress or tribulation. Not life or death. Not principalities or powers can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you know him, he's sticking to you right to the end. He's going to finish the good work which he began in you, Philippians 1 says. And he's going to take you home to glory and conform you to his glory. And you'll be forever with the Lord. May the Lord give us joy in that thought, brothers and sisters. And may we show ourselves to be loyal friends, first to our God, and then to our nation, to the government God's put over us, to Israel that still... God says, preach the gospel to them. It's the power of God unto salvation. And also to our friends, that we might show our friendship and loyalty by being one who shows them the Lord Jesus Christ, being a loyal friend like he is. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for the Lord Jesus, and we just find him so extraordinary, his faithfulness, that in the worst of times, he's a faithful friend. 
He's truly a friend in need. When we're in need, the Lord's right there for us. Whenever we turn to him, he's there. There's nothing we can go through that the Lord deserts us. The one who knew what it was to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Himself says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We know he was forsaken for us, that he died for our sins. But we thank thee, Father, that he's loyal and faithful. And we do pray that we'd be loyal too. That in our lives this week, we'd show our loyalty to thyself in private. And even how we treat others, we'd show that loyalty, that covenant love that's been extended to us, that we enjoy and that we live out for the glory of Christ. We pray it in the Lord Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you.